Great to see you. God is good, amen. amen. His mercies are to be praised forever and ever. We have come today to thank God for what he has done, for what he is doing, and yet and still what he will do in our lives. Because we have a belief in the power that we have an active God who loves us and who has plans for us. And no matter how much we fall, no matter how off the track and course we get, he brings us back. If we but call upon him, he puts us back on the path and leads us on. Oh, I love our God. I don't know about you. He's amazing. I um, figure out how I want to do this. We're going to get into the message in just a bit. <laughs> Some of you are thinking, that's not the message, Pastor. Shorten it up. But I want to turn real quickly to the book of John. And we are in the 13th chapter of the book of John. See, one of the ways in which we remind ourselves to get back on the path when God is calling us is by this ordinance here. It is called the foot washing. And we in this church do foot washing, all of us. Some churches do just the uh, pastors and the priests. Some do it on a different day. We've chosen, not any real reason uh, to make us special, we've just chosen to do it, all of us, every quarter, to remind ourselves that we are God's servants. We are to humble ourselves before each other. I want to read a little bit from that book. It's uh, John, the 13th chapter. And I'm going to be reading um, verse 1 and on. It says, it was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave the world, to go to his Father, having loved his own, that's us, Who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. And then down a few verses. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. And that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal. He took off the outer clothing. And he wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin. And he began to wash the disciples' feet with a towel that was wrapped around him. He took on the garb as a servant to show us how we ought to act. At the end of this ordinance, he said, now that I, your Lord and Savior, has washed your feet, you ought to also wash one another's feet. There are a couple reasons we do this. And, and I mean, be clear. If you don't feel called to participate in this, no shame. No, don't worry about it. If you'd rather sit there in the church and wait till we start uh, the rest of the service on uh, quiet meditation, no problem. No stress. There's no judgment. For those of you who have chosen to participate in this, we do this for a few reasons. We do this, one, because God has called us to. We do this, two, because it is a time where we remind ourselves to humble ourselves. And come before one another. I encourage people who have had frictions with each other in the past to wash each other's feet. Wash off all of that tension and stress and toxicity. That's why I encourage almost more than any other husbands and wives to wash each other's feet. Because I know how much the devil tries to get into that marriage and create an atmosphere of stress. And toxics. Toxics is that word? And frustration. And so we encourage each other to wash each other's feet, to remind ourselves that um, we serve each other, that we love each other, humble ourselves before each other. And finally, the last reason is because as we have our feet washed, we remind ourselves that we are clean. Okay? We are not clean by what we do or don't do. We are clean because God has cleansed us himself. Okay? 
It's not our great works. It's not our great giving. It's not our great uh, faithfulness that makes us clean. It is God's great work. It is God's great giving in the form of Jesus Christ on the cross. It is God's great sacrifice that makes us clean. And so we do this in recognition of that, to remind ourselves not to listen to the enemy, not to listen to the doubts, not to listen to anything, but to walk free and bold in the power of him who has cleansed us. For everyone who has accepted Jesus Christ, if you're willing, I invite you now to go outside and wash each other's feet. If you would like to participate in this, but you don't have a partner, just ask myself or one of our elders, and we will set you up with somebody. Um, and again, if you don't want to take place, take part, no big deal. We just ask that you remain in the sanctuary in um, quiet, peaceful meditation, thanking God for what he's done for you. We will be back in about five minutes. No more. seated. Um, I want to thank Andres for stepping in. They're going to be doing the special music. Here's the crazy thing. He didn't know the song. He just kind of played it by ear. He's like, oh, wait, it goes sort of like this. Da, da, da. My goodness, man. With both hands, God gave to you. <laughs> Amazing. We are here to praise and thank God for what he's done. Father in heaven, we thank you for this moment in time. We thank you for the fact that we can all be from many different locations, many different uh, places and races and mindsets. But when we come together in you, we are one. One ohana, one force, one church. I thank you, Lord. I thank you for loving us in spite of of us and calling us to greater than we are on our own. We thank you today for Jesus. We ask now that you would speak to us in your heavenly name. Amen. We've been walking together through the life of Elisha. Of focusing on the ministries that Elisha was able to do through prayer. We wanted to focus on prayer this month to prepare us for all that is to come in 2016. I've been talking with Auntie Elsie, I've been talking with Mandy, I've been talking with Paul, I've been talking with several in this place. And we have much in store for this family. We're going to do great things together, but before we start anything, we must pray. Because prayer is the foundation for all we do. So we've been focusing on that. We looked at Elisha and we saw how prayer can come in many forms. It doesn't always come. In fact, mostly, the most effective prayers do not come on your knees. They come in the midst of your chaos. There's an old story where we had three pastors talking about what's the most effective position for prayer. And one pastor said, oh, brothers, you have to be on your knees praying to God for him to hear your prayers. And the other pastor said, no, 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 no. Like Daniel, we must stand up and stretch our arms towards heaven for God to truly hear our prayers. And another said, oh, brothers, you all have it all wrong. The most important position is humility. So you must be prostrate on the ground before God to hear your prayers. And as they were arguing, a window washer came in. 
And he said, sir, what do you think is the most effective position for prayer? And he thought about it and he said, dangling 20 stories up from my rig. <laughs> True prayer happens in life. As we live life. So we've seen Elisha. As Elijah is taken up from him and he cries out and he's unsure of which way to go. He uh, crawls out to God. Will the God of Elijah be with me, Elisha? And in faith, he strikes the river, and sure enough, God is with him, and he gives him a double portion. And then we saw how he walks forth, and he looks out, and he sees the armies surrounding him. And his servant is trembling with fear, saying, what are we going to do? And so Elisha prays for double vision. Let's my servants see what I don't need to see because I see it in faith, not by sight. And his servant's eyes are opened up and he sees the armies of God surrounding the enemy. And he reminds him, those who are with us are far greater than those who are with them. And so we prayed on that week for double vision for each of us so that we might see God in our lives through unseen things. So that we might know that he who is with us is greater than he who is against us. Can I get an amen? amen. Jeremiah had a wonderful sermon about importunate prayer. Okay, That's earnest prayer that you just pour your entire self out into. And we saw this lady who had gotten the son, and the son was lost. And so Elijah steps in. And Elijah lays upon the boy and takes the place of God in his life and breathes into him. And earnestly, he draws himself closer to God, and God answers his prayer. And the boy gets up and walks. Today, I wanted to pray, uh, speak on thanksgiving through prayer. And as I thought about it, I said, what is the greatest type of thanksgiving? The greatest type of, of, of recognizing what God is and thanking him through prayer. I said, the, the most common type is thanking him for what he is doing. Is God doing things in your life right now? Oh, praise God. Everybody say, thank you, God. He's powerful, he's active, and he's good. And that's, that, that, that's awesome. We should, every day, thank him for the things he is doing for us. Any of you struggle with anxiety? Any of you struggle with uh, fear? They say that uh, the two centers of the brain that, that hold anxiety and gratitude are in the same place. And so, scientifically, they cannot exist together. So if you're feeling anxious, if you're feeling uh, terrified, if you're feeling unsure, start thanking God for what he is doing, and you will feel it dissipate. Now, I always have to do a caveat. There's some anxiety that's caused by um, uh, hormones in the brain that are off kilter, and sometimes you need help with that. Please get the help you need. God blesses us and helps us through prayer and through medicine, through all ways. All glory to God. Amen. Okay, so I don't want anybody out there to say, well, pastor, son, don't take my medicine anymore. <laughs> but I am saying this, that when you get nervous about the future, it's important to praise God for the, as the one who holds the future in his hands. Amen. Yeah. Second type of prayer that's amazing is praising God for what he has done, thanking God for what he has done in your life. Okay, sometimes we look around, we say, I don't feel like God is doing anything for me right now. I feel like my prayers are bouncing off the ceiling. They ain't even reaching it. They're hitting the fan before they hit the ceiling. It's bouncing right back to me. Well, it's at that time that we need to look backwards and say, God, I don't feel you now, but I know you have been there in the past. Anybody in this place have God do things for them in the past? Anybody absolutely sure that God has taken an active role in your life up until this point? Well, then let's praise him for what he has done. Because it's important. It's powerful to remember. We may not see it now, but just because we can't see it now doesn't mean it's not happening. And so what we do is we look backwards to see, oh, remember that time? Remember that time I didn't think he was there? But now I look back, I realize he was with me all the way. 
holding me and carrying me. And the time I thought I was sinking under the water, I didn't realize that I was on God's shoulders. He was keeping me afloat. So we thank God for that. But as I was struggling with this, I found that there is a prayer that is even greater. A thanksgiving that is, to me, the next step in the Christian process. And that is thanking God, not for what he is doing, not for what he has done, do that, but thanking God for what he will do. Saying, God, I've got something going on in my life right now. And I know that you do good things for me. I know that you have done good things for me. But you don't understand. This is something that's never happened before. And I cannot see a way out. And it's in those times, it's in those times that we press close to the throne and we say, thank you, God, for what you will do. For I have an absolute faith that you are with me and that you will do for me what you have promised to do for me. Jonah is a great example of this prayer. He is wrapped up in seaweed, bottom of the ocean, in the belly of a whale. And they record his prayer there. And in the belly of the whale, at the bottom of the ocean, seaweed around his face, he is basically sashimi. He prays a prayer of thanksgiving to God and says, Thank you, God, for delivering me from this beast. He had run from God. He had ignored God. He had uh, had himself thrown in the ocean so he didn't have to listen to God. And after three days in the belly of the whale, he recognizes something. God's not done with me yet. And I don't know how I'm going to get out of this, but I know my God. I said, I know my God. Amen. Does anybody in this place know their God? Amen. And they know that he will do what he has promised he will do. You may not see a way out. You may not feel a way out. You may smell fish all around you and be in total darkness. But my God will do what he said he will do. So I thank him from this place. Amen. Now, what does thanks mean? So often, thanks has become like the word love, cheap, and just used, and we throw it around. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Mahalo. First year of my life, I thought mahalo uh, in Hawaii meant trash. Yeah. <laughs> McDonald's and little trash can there said mahalo on it. I'm like, <laughs> look, mom, I've got some mahalo. Oh, mahalo. She's like, son, that's, that's Apollo. That's not, that's not, mahalo means thank you, mahalo. And a lot of us are like that. We don't understand what true mahalo, what true thanks actually is. And we use it cheap, throwaway, like refuse. True thanksgiving is seen by action. True thanksgiving is seen by the way we act our lives. When we thank God for saving us, for being the God who died on a cross for us, laid himself out, shed his blood, and broke his body so that we might live. It's wonderful to say thank you, God, for that. But action shows our heart. And so that's why we gather together. That's why we sing in praises. That's why we live our life in service to one another. Today I want to tell you one more story from Elisha's life. On living thanksgiving. For what you know God will do. Turn with me in your Bibles, quickly, to the book of 2 Kings. In the book of 2 Kings, and we're going to go into chapter uh, 11. Chapter 11 of the book of 2 Ah, uh, no, don't show it yet. I don't know what that is. It's uh, 2 Kings, and it's 11, 20, and 21. My handwriting must have been really bad this time. 2 Kings 11, 20, so here, don't show it yet. But, sorry, sorry, 2 Kings 11, 20. So here's what's happening, here's what's happening. Elisha, the great prophet of God, the, the one who had a double portion of power, the one who was uh, arguably greater than Elijah, right? He is sick. And you would think like, well, no big deal. 
He's a prophet of God. Just pray the healing over yourself. Physician, heal thyself. But it's not going to work. Elisha's been told that this illness will end in your death. When the king, Joash, hears this, he races from his courtroom to be at Elisha's side. You see, Elisha is the one who has been uh, giving him tips and warnings when the enemy comes in. It says, oh, the enemy is going to ambush you here. Go over here. The enemy is going to be over here. Go over here instead. This is how you defeat the enemy. And now Joash is about to lose that. And he doesn't know what he's going to do. So he falls at Elisha's bedside and says, my father, my father. What will I do? He cries out, the horsemen and chariots of Israel, which means you are the strength of this kingdom. I don't know what I'm going to do without you. You see, Joash was one of the is kings of Israel. All the kings of Israel were wicked. Joash practiced idolatry and things like that. And yet and still, God still blessed him. Elisha says, you don't get it, son. This is the Nelson translation. You don't get it, son. It hasn't been me that's been with you all this time. It's been God. So go get your arrows. Okay? Now take an arrow out and shoot it out the window. So Joash does that. He says, that arrow is an arrow of victory. And just as sure as that arrow struck the ground, God will give you victory in your life if you but believe in him. And so he says, I'll grab some arrows and strike them on the ground to show your faith in the victory that God is going to give you. So Joash is like, oh, okay. He grabs the arrows and goes, mm, mm, mm. And it says Elisha on his deathbed gets angry. He says, Hi. again, Nelson translation, what's wrong with you? If you had struck the ground like five or six times in true faith, you would have seen God completely and totally give you victory over all enemies in your life. How many people of you have found that to be true? But because you've half-heartedly, in fear and weakness, struck it three times, just, he'll give you three victories. But he wanted to give you so much more. And then it says Elisha dies. Now, the end of this chapter, it says Elisha rises up, or not Elisha, um, uh, Joash rises up and goes out to fight against the enemy, and he has three victories, just as God said. And so even then, even in our faithlessness, God can bless us. If we but give even just, just, just a mustard seed of faith. But in between the story of his three victories and his calling him to have faith, there is a story that shows Joash and shows us what God truly wants to do with those who have faith in the unseen, who thank God for things that cannot be but will be. You know what? I'm just going to tell you the story. Trust me, it's in the Bible. I'll give you the text after. <laughs> God's like, Tim, you're getting a big head. You think you're only barely getting by. I want you to know you're not getting by at all. So I'm going to give you something to humble you. <laughs> Forgive me. But the thing is, I have um, Miguel back there. We're just going to phase this out of the stream. It's never happened. So starting here. Um, so this is what God tells Joash. This is what God tells us, if you would just believe. Because in the middle of that story, this is what he says. In the middle of that story, he says this. He says, Joash died, or Elisha died, and he was buried. Sometime later, bands were raiding the land. And some people were going out to bury a man, and they saw the raiders coming. And so they threw the man, quickly, to get away, into the grave, into the grave of Elisha. And when the man touched Elisha's bones, when the dead man touched Elisha's bones, he stood up and was restored full to life. Somebody say amen. amen. 
You see, today we are here to thank God for the great thing that he is going to do in us. Many of us today find ourselves like that man. In dead places. Sorry? Chapter 13. Verse 20 and 21. That was 13, not 11. Where I got 11. Well, you can go read it for yourself now. Thank you, sis. Chapter 13, verse 11 and 21. There we go. Moabite raiders used to enter the country every spring. Once, while some Israelites were burying a man, suddenly they saw a band of raiders, so they threw the man's body into Elisha's tomb. When the body touched Elisha's bone, the man came to life and stood on his feet. I did pretty good, huh? All right. The dead man was raised to life because of the one who went to that place ahead of him. That one was so filled with power that just as his touch came to the dead man, it gave the dead man life. Does that sound familiar to you? The story of one who is filled with power who went to the grave ahead of us? So powerful that all who would come to the grave after him, if they but are touched by him, would receive life? Who does that sound like today, brothers and sisters? Somebody say Jesus. I want you to know right now that whatever grave that you are struggling with today, whatever dark place you may find yourself in, whatever place of loss and death, you have, whether it be for your marriage, whether it be for your business, whether it be for your health, your joy, whatever it is, and you find yourself thrown into a grave, a place that just is a final end. There is someone who has been there before you. There is someone who has been there, and when we watch what he did, I always wonder why he did this. And there are a lot of examples, none of them historically accurate. Why did he leave the grave clothes in the grave? Some people said, well, it's because if they fold it up, it means they're coming back to get them. I researched that. There's nothing historical with that. That's actually just a nice pastor's thing to say. A nice pastor's idea. Nice idea. But when I read this, it dawned on me. He left the grave clothes there to remind people who came into the grave, I've been here. I've been here. But I'm not anymore. But what I left for you is my power for you to get out of this place. Remember the lady who had the subject of, who was the subject of bleeding? 12 years? What did she touch in order for her to be completely healed and restored? The hem of his garment, his clothes. He didn't have to be there, but the power was there. So Jesus Christ, though he was crucified, put in the grave, resurrected, and left the grave, he left something there so that when you get there, you realize you're not alone. You've got power in this place. What grave place are you in right now? Only you and God know. But if you have been touched by Jesus Christ, then you have been given a way out. That's what today represents. A recognition and a holding to that way out. It may look like a grave to the world. But we can give a prayer of thanksgiving as we are going into it, into the darkness, into the scary thing. We can give a prayer of thanksgiving knowing that this journey into the grave will not be our final destination. But it's a round trip ticket. We're coming back out because we have Jesus. And as we come out, we don't just come out the same, but we come out transformed. 
Because those dead things in their life have been brought back, have been resurrected. And now we live in boldness and confidence as a testimony of what God has done in us. Today, as we come up to get, or as you get your, um, your emblems passed out to you, the deacons are also going to pass out a card. And on this card, I want you to, if you would like, write a thanksgiving to God for what he will do in your life. Take an act of faith to say, I'm going through a grave right now, but I know that God will bring me through this, and so I write my thanksgiving now in pure faith. I'm going to strike the ground a hundred times to let the world know that God is with us. I want to invite the deacons forward. I want to invite Andres and Ronnie forward. And I want to invite our elders forward. Father in heaven, I thank you for breaking the bread and spilling the wine so that we could live a life of thanksgiving for you. Bless these, we pray. Let them truly remind us of who we are in you. In your heavenly name, amen. in my feet He's okay if his heart to believe I have faith that you will do greater things It's my time to go but before I leave go Tell the world about me I was dead but now I live I've got to go now for a little while But goodbye is not the end Don't forget things that I taught you. I've conquered death and I hold the keys. Where I go, you will go to someday. But there's much to do here before you leave. Is 
God is not the end. Has everyone been served so far? Oh, we're over here. Excellent. Thank you. Chase, can't forget mom. Okay. How about, Auntie, do you have a grape juice? Oh, yeah, okay, good. Everyone else? We want to make sure that everybody who wants to partake can partake. After the service, I'm going to put the prayer box and the cross in front of the Christmas tree. If you have your thanksgiving to God, I invite you to come and place it down at your time when you're ready into the prayer box. We will pray over it. We will pray with it. And we will thank God for all that he is doing for you. All right. Everybody have? Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Excellent job. Now, has everybody been served who would like to be served? Gentlemen, thank you. Ladies, thank you so much. Are you the brother of the one? He's the brother. Okay. For I received from the Lord, that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Eat all of it. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. You know what I love to say at this time? Never has something so little represented so much to so many. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. At the Last Supper, there was no prayer. They simply went out praising God. And so we too are going to do likewise. We're going to go out and praise God for what he has done in our lives, what he is doing right now, and what he will do in the future. If you have a reason to thank God, let me hear you say thank you. Thank you. Happy Sabbath, everybody. God loves you. So do we. Have a wonderful week. Miguel's going to come up in just a few minutes to do uh, announcements. Um, but until then, I just want to thank each and every one of you for being an amazing part of this Ohana. We love you. How do these guys do? First time for a while, uh, our elders coming up and being up here. I want to thank them. Good job. Ladies, Auntie Rose, always thank you so much.